I am. I got a big mouth, so, and a deep voice, so I think we're good. <laughs> well, good evening, gang. Thanks for showing up. I promise I won't try to bore you tonight, at the very least. I am handing you a three by five card. Uh, part of this, <laughs> part of this presentation is I do a Q and A, uh, and I learn. Actually, I learn more from you folks than. I think from my books, but like this, thanks. I'm gonna get tested, but I know the teacher. We're good. Okay. We're good. Thank you. you bet. Look at this nice family right here. So usually I kind of wait for Q&A, but I, since we've got a fairly small group, I think if you've got a question, you know, about God's word or psychology, if I, I don't know it, I'll tell you, and I'll look it up. But uh, anything in the midst of our presentation tonight. I take a deep breath. I'm going to keep you about an hour. If you need to get up or stretch your legs or get a cup of coffee, we can do that, right? So don't feel embarrassed about that. I had a talk with my wife, and uh, she suggested, you know, it's a nice evening. They may not want to stay an hour and a half, so let's see how it goes, right? <laughs> you do? Okay. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, once again, thanks for showing up. I appreciate it. You voted with your feet that maybe, just maybe, you can leave here tonight with some new tools in your toolbox in regard to relationships. You know, basically everything in our life uh, revolves around relationships. In a minute, we're going to open up God's Word, and we're going to go to uh, Genesis 1, verses 27 and 28. I'll give you a heads up. And the thing that's very striking to me is that I got saved a while ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth. And I, <laughs> I still remember I had this tremendous uh, thirst to study God's word. Um, I got grandsons now that uh, they're just starting to get into it. I'm so excited, you know. So they look at my old Bible and they say, man, Grandpa, you got this sucker marked up. I said, that's the only way I can remember stuff. <laughs> Right? Yeah, the binding goes. Let's, uh, so, so part of our presentation is going to be uh, scriptural. It better be, right? And then the other part is that I'm going to kind of go from a, a science aspect. So I've had this debate before that, you know, uh, pure science is pure Bible, right? So um, I'm going to interject quite a lot of science and studies. I follow... Uh, most of the reliable think tanks in the country, uh, places like Harvard, Northwestern, um, I follow most of their studies. I know I'm a research geek, but uh, it's just really cool. You know, psychology, can I kind of go down a rabbit hole for a minute? Psychology has really changed in the last 20 years. I mean, it's grown in leaps and bounds. When I went to school, uh, I got done in 73, did some master's work at UConn. But back then, psychology and research were just two separate entities. But the very exciting thing about 25 years, don't quote me on the date, but researchers and clinical psychologists started to get together, and some remarkable things came out of it. For example, when you walk up to something at Home Depot or at Lowe's, or at uh, a restaurant, and they have a name tag on, if you say their name, their brain lights up like a Christmas tree. Amen. Thank you. If you, uh, in, a, in an honest, good way, touch someone, give them a pat on the back, and I know, you know that's all, things have changed so crazy, but from your fingertips to someone's shoulder, uh, once again, their brain lights up like a Christmas tree. So sadly, we have lost the ability to touch people uh, in their hearts and because 
You know, we, uh, we were created to uh, connect. You know, in a minute, we're going to look at uh, uh, Genesis. And, you know, you and I woke up this morning, and we serve an inherently relational God. I mean, early in the garden, he went down and he talked to Adam about naming the animals. And so the whole, the whole process of rubbing shoulders with people, you know, is ingrained on in our faith. I also want to thank Devin for doing my sound tonight. Thanks, Dev. I'll make him turn red back there. Okay, so let's, let's roll up our sleeves. Let's turn to Genesis. Actually, I'm going to be in Genesis 1, verses 27 and 28. I know, if you're like me, you got some pages missing, right? <laughs> okay, so God rolls up his sleeve, and God starts to create, Right? And then he gets to mankind, and some marvelous things happen. Take a look at this. Then God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock, over the earth, and all over the creatures that move along the ground. So my number one scripture tonight, and I think it hits home, and I think you would agree with this, is that since... Check this out. Since we were created in God's image, and because uh, he's inherently relational, that's a call for us to be the same. Amen. Amen? Amen. And I'm not talking just in church. You know, work. You know, you spend a large, I'm retired, well, almost retired, and uh, we all have spent our in the process of spent spending an inordinate amount of time, pardon me, in the workplace. And what better place, even with all its challenges and stress along the way, what better place uh, where we could speak into someone's life? You know, I'm convinced tonight as I sit here that God has put some very important intentional people in your life and in my, all for the purpose of getting us from point A to point B. So we reach out and, you know, the people, everyone's got a story to tell, right? You've heard that. You know, I spend these days now, I uh, volunteer doing some counseling. I got certified real quick years ago through the VA. I, I did uh, six months clinical and psychiatric ward in New York City. I wasn't a patient. Uh, they locked four doors behind us every morning. I never forget that. I was young. You know, I think I was 23 when I was there. I never forget it. So um, because we serve this God who's tremendously relational, you know, God, get, and I'm, I'm sure of this, God gives us this extra antenna system. When we go by someone or we hear someone who's struggling, the antennas go up. And so, so because of that, uh, God gives us the grace. God gives us the, uh, the intentionality. That's an important word, right, when reaching out to people, to, to reach into someone's heart and, and, if nothing else, to be a good listener. So I think, you know, someone asked me, I think it was in Binghamton, you know, they said, Tom, what are the two key points, or two key books, pardon me, in regard to relationships with people. And I, and I got to tell you, I collect old books. If you ever come to visit, I know I'm very antiquated because no one uses books anymore, but I still like them. Uh, I collect old books, and I picked up a, a commentary set that went through seven pastors in New England, and every one of them made little notes in the Bible. So I, and I think I paid $65 for uh, 15 sets, 15 books of this commentary. I, I remember the old timer, he said, you a pastor? I said, no, I just teach Sunday school. He says, well, I'll give you a break. So he charged me $65, what a deal. So, but in those pages, in those wrinkled, tattered, coffee-stained pages are these gems of wisdom 
that these pastors had jotted down and just, whoo, really spoke to my heart. So, so back, back to that question I got from that lady in Binghamton. So two key books that old timers uh, really uh, very often put their head on at night next to their pillow was the book of, and I'll tell you why in a second, the book of Psalms and the book of Proverbs. Now, some of you are Psalmaholics like me, but the neat thing about the book of Psalms is our relationship to God. So as we look at these uh, seven relationships that are going on in your life and my life, of course, the most prominent one is the one that's God at the top. So even in this crazy, crazy world that we live in and we get up in the morning, we think it can't get any worse, it does. Right? But God says, uh, he says a lot in his word that, you know, we need to follow his commandments. You know, the neat thing about the book of Psalms, I mean, if I was going to take the book of Psalms and, and I would squeeze it and render it into like one little <clears throat> important point, the impo- I think the most important or uh, life-changing uh, fact about Psalms is, is that we know when we finish the book, it, uh, undoubtedly we know what God expects from us, and here's the other side of this, and what uh, we need to expect or can expect to see in God. How cool is that, right? So you see David, you know, he's in a cave and he's up against it and there's people chasing him and he continues to reach out with all his shortcomings. He continues to reach out to God. So, so if, if I got my act together as, and I call myself a Christian, and not because I got a bumper sticker on my back, but I, feel, I truly feel I have Christ in my heart, there ought to be this ongoing, here's that word again, intentionality to walk close with the scriptures. I mean, the scriptures do a lot of things. They give us what? Our authority through life, Right? And I think the other neat thing is that the scriptures have, ready for, as a tradesman, scriptures have a tremendous utility to them, right? So, so talk about a toolbox. So, so the old timers, back to my story, the old timers would spend some time every single day in the Psalms. And then, because that's their vertical relationship with God. And then on, in the same day before the sun went down, they would spend a large amount of time in the book of Proverbs, which is our relationship or our horizontal relationship with people. Now, I'll let you in a little secret, okay? My ability to be the husband to that blonde lady over there and to be a good husband is totally dependent on my relationship to be right with God. So if my vertical relationship is correct, guess what? There's a real good chance my horizontal relationships are going to be good. Amen? Amen. So, as we, as we go through the scriptures, you know, as, as Christians, um, there's, just, there's just a wealth of, of scriptures that speak of the necessity for us to make a difference in other people's lives. i just give you a few, you know, we, get, we don't have a ton of time, but let me give you a few. Uh, Genesis 2.18, it's not good for man to be alone. Proverbs 17.17, 17, a friend loves at all times. Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives. 1 Peter 4.8, love one another. Uh, you know, we just got done with this crazy COVID stuff. And uh, I had three families that were struggling with suicides that took place in their families. Uh, so I spent, I spent a tremendous amount of time just, just wringing my hands and just researching, you know, all the data out there. And, and one of the things you find out is that, you know, people that are really struggling, I mean, really struggling up here, what happens is they unplug from other people. You know, that's all the signs, you know. If you look at notes that people leave or are struggling and pass it on to a friend or a loved one because they need some help, there's a lot of eyes in the letter. You know, I've studied the anatomy of those letters for hours and hours, and I can tell you when they pick up a pen, 
you know, they're pretty much disconnected from people. So here's one for your notes. If you don't hear anything else tonight, I want you to take this. The greatest pill that you can take for you and your well-being other than God is, ready, people. If someone walks up to us tomorrow and pokes us, we ought to bleed people. In a couple of minutes, I'm going to give you a list, a very specific list of people that belong in your life and in my life. All for the reason is that they are encouragers. They help us get to a place where we need to be. They're the confidants where we're free and, and feel safe to, to share things that we're struggling with. Amen? Amen? All right, so I'm coming to you tonight, you know, I'm rolling up my sleeves and you know, relation, I, I won't lie to you. You know, we all know this, right? Relationships are difficult. Uh, I mean, a lot of times we like to blame because of money issues or because of poor communication or because of family chemistry. But the reality is, you probably should put this in your notes too, is that other people are difficult. <laughs> Not that we are, but other people are difficult. You know, my last couple of years I taught at the college, and I would get so excited. I was preparing uh, these students to go out just before they went to student teaching. I had the dean's daughter, and, she, and uh, after the semester, she came up to me. She said, Tom, why don't you work at the college? I said, I don't have time to go to the bathroom. She said, just try it. Just try it. And I loved it. I was there, I think, three or four years. Well, anyway, I would get so excited in my presentations. You remember those halls that go up like this? You remember those days? And the students would raise their hands and they'd say, hey, boss, you got to slow down, man. My, bur my pen is burning up. So I I'll try not to go so fast tonight. All right, so, so, you know, one of the most difficult things in relationship, of course, is people. Uh, and, and the reason for that, is, there's a couple of reasons. Can I, can I be honest with you and painfully upfront with you? I can, I can tell you f uh, from the studies that I've looked over the last 25 years is that, you know, you and I are for the most part a product of our family chemistry. We learn what relationship looked like back then. The problem is, is not all families are perfect, and sometimes that view or that lesson or that schoolroom was skewed. It wasn't where it needed to be. You know, I've I've uh, counseled uh, kiddos that have been uh, sexual abused and emotionally abused. Sorry. And then what happens is when they get in a relationship, they're skewed. Because their family chemistry, it's ingrained in them. Now, the power of God, God has the, you know, we serve, here's the word, right? We serve a redemptive God. What does that mean, Bashiani? Okay, I won't tell you what it means in Greek because I don't remember. But I will tell you a redemptive God is when God reaches in, grabs your hand, and helps you get to a place where you need to be. Amen? So, so what happens is, is... You know, couples do have money problems and, and couples do have communication problems. And I spend a lot of hours with couples to kind of get them where they can argue uh, civilly, you know, and, and kind of uh, be okay with conflict resolution. I mean, we all go through, let's be honest, we all go through patches in life that are, ask my wife, I've been married almost 50 years now. And there's some times where the shingles kind of shook on the roof. But we're still together by the power of God and God's grace. Amen? Okay. So, so we get this family chemistry that's not always the best. So that enters into these relationships that we find ourselves in. And I'm not only talking marital relationships. I'm talking about work too, you know. I was the vice president for the teachers union for, I don't know, 10 years, I think. And my boss would call me in there. He'd say, Bashiani, you need, you need to calm these people down. They're beating me up. You know, people, they, they take, people uh, have different uh, 
tools that they use to confront, right? And some of them, they're just not real healthy. Some years ago, I uh, uh, counseled a state trooper, nice guy, and he had some major anger issues. Nicest guy you ever want to meet. Had a beautiful family. And he said, I remember him sitting down tearfully and said, you know, Bosh, I just, I just get so angry at these idiots sometimes. And so, so what um, psychologists do and therapists do is that we try to give people at each ses- session different tools to try to kind of get, f- to help them get from point A to point B. Okay? So, the... As we sit here tonight as Christians on May 21st in 2023, I got to tell you, our ability uh, to uh, belly up to different relationships, whether it's marital or at work or just a simple acquaintance, one of the most powerful ways to address that is, I, I know this is an old hippie word, but I think it really fits, is we need to take in a holistic Approach. I don't know if I can even spell that, but you know what that means in psychology? That means we look at the mind, we look at the body, and we look at the soul. Okay, so a few minutes ago we looked at, at uh, Genesis, and the reality is, is that, as David said, you know, we got to follow God's commands, right? So for me to be the husband that God expects me to, for me to be the teacher or I turned her professor back then. For me, to my ability to do that correctly or and have my horizontal relationships to be where they needed to be, my relationship with God had to be correct, right? Now, here's the thing. You know, we all go, I, I said a few minutes ago, we, we all go through these leads. I call them tough patches in life. And I don't care if you're seven years old or, am I 72? 72 years old. We all go through different tough patches in life. And, and, what we need to remember is, is that one of the, you know, talk about the utility of God's word. As we pick up God's word and we read it, you know, some very profound things start to happen in our heart. Some years ago, I, uh, I was working my second job. I was teaching, and we ran a construction business, and we would save, real quick, we would save all our steel. And we had a dump truck, and I always kept a brand new Bible in the dump truck. Now, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie to you. Say, well, I gave out eight million Bibles. I, I didn't give out that many. But one day, I pulled into the scrapyard in Syracuse. Pretty tough place to be, and I had a load on. And this guy was at the scales. And I'm gonna call him Mike Tyson because he looked exactly like Mike Tyson. He had two gold teeth. So I go through the scales, and Mike. I'll call him Mike. His name's not Mike. And Mike goes, pull it in. That's how, I mean, I got a deep voice, but it's like four octaves below. Pull it in. So I pull a truck in. He weighs it. I dump it coming out. And then God kind of, not audibly, but kind of tucks on my sleeve. He says, Bashiana, give him a Bible. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so I saw the I saw the Syracuse newspaper with my face on it, you know. Chubby man stabbed with ice pick. <laughs> so I get out of the truck, and he looks at me like inquisitive, like, what's this old guy want, right? Although I wasn't that old now. Well, it wasn't gray anyway. So I said, I don't know why, but I just feel like I got to give you this. And he takes it and he looks. He says, I don't, I don't want that. I said, throw it away if you want. But I'm telling you, God tugged to my heart and four months go by. I pull in the same yard. Who's working? Mike Tyson. <laughs> and Mike, I, he weighs me out. And then I'm about to leave and he goes, I go, well, here it goes. And he, I rolled down the window. It was cold. I think it was November. He said, can I, can, this is, I mean, a really deep voice. He said, can I have a word with you? I said, sure. He says, get out of the truck. I said, oh, here we go. <laughs> I've been punched by the best. So I got out of the truck. He said, you know that Bible you gave me? I said, yeah, I know. You threw it away. He said, no. My grand, listen to this. This is going to knock your socks off. He said, my grandmother's been after me my whole life to read the Bible. But it's, it's, it's not me. I said, I know. I know. He said, no, you don't understand. I, she's got me reading Book of John, and I know that's me, not me, but I, I know I need to be that me. I need to be that person. So thanks. <laughs> True story. So God's word does some amazing things. 
All right, so can I do a little science with you? Once again, pure Bible is pure science. So not to bore you, and I, I promise I'm not going to be very academic, but real quick, I want you to understand what's going on in your head and relationships, all right? Because I can tell you it's not always the money or not always poor communication skills, although that could be part of it. But a lot, I take a deep breath, a lot has to do with how we think, all right? So if you, if you look at the brain, right, and probably mine's pretty small, but if you look at the brain, <laughs> we, there's a lot of parts, but, but the two basic parts are the, the front lobe, right? You're laughing, but that's where all your thinking and logic comes about. And it takes a lot of energy in the brain to run that sucker, right? So what happens is, is that when God created you, and he created me. He made another part in our brain, in the middle cortex of the brain, and that's where our unconscious kicks in. You ever drive to work, and then all of a sudden you say, man, I don't even remember how I got here. You ever done that? Ooh, I've been. Yeah. <laughs> I drove to Florida like that. <laughs> Just kidding. So <laughs> my wife's shaking her head. So, so what happens is, is that, let me break it down real quick, not to bore you, but scientifically what happens is the center part or the center lobe cortex of your brain, ready for this, gets on the average of 60,000 thoughts a day. Whew. Pardon? Even then? Oh, men too. Well, that's another lecture. You can't believe the data on that, Alice. I'm not going to make these guys' faces. I'm, I got you, Keith. I got you, bud. <laughs> so the center cortex, and that's where our feelings are, we get about 60,000 hits a day, all right? The front lobal part of your brain, that's where your logic and thinking and where you make choices, there's about six, about 6,000 thoughts a day. Now, the problem is... The front part of your brain and the middle part, they don't get along too good. In fact, they never talk to each other. Because when the, the center brain kicks up and that's pretty much our emotions, what happens is uh, our center part of our brain wants nothing to do with it. So, so what happens in counseling is that a lot of people that struggle in, in relationships is that they're listening to the center brain more than the front lobe. Let me tell you about emotions for a minute, all right? I take a deep breath because I think we can all relate to this. But so a couple of facts, once again, I won't bore you, but a couple of facts about emotions. Emotions are very short-lived, okay? And, and the reason why God gave us emotions, you know, they're not bad things, although we can use them improperly. Emo ready for this? Emotions are your early warning system of impending danger. What do you mean by that, Bashiani? Every, check this out. I can show you the data. Every single thing that you go through, your brain takes a snapshot and stows it away. Now, it originally first gets stowed in the front part of your brain, but when you go to sleep and you really do sleep and you start to go into to high REM sleep, all that data is stored in the center part of the brain for your memory, Okay. Now, the problem is, is that sometimes our sleeping habits aren't the best. And the, my brain, especially my little pea brain, uses a lot of energy at night. You're, the center part of your brain never sleeps, okay? That's the unconscious one. You know, you're still breathing, right? And you twitch. And if you're like me, you turn over 8 million times in the night because your shoulder hurts or your knees hurt. Can you relate to that, Lance? <laughs> So, so what happens is when you come up uh, to a situation, a uh, situation in a, in a relationship, and, and you start getting these warning signs, that's your emotions kicking in. That's the way God made you, all right? The problem is, is that you need to identify the thoughts that you're getting. Is it a cognitive thought from the front part of your brain, or is it a thought from the midship part of your brain? Make sense? Okay. So you got front cortex and you got mid cortex. Okay, let's go a little further. We're doing good on time. So, so 
ready? So, so thinking affects your feelings, which are your emotion, right? You've heard that old saying, stinking thinking? Yeah, so, you know, I'm in the business to help give people tools to get them to a place of positive thinking, right? There's two things that you have control over in a, on any day, and I don't care how old you are. I could, once again, I could show you the data. You are ready for this? And I don't care how depressed you are or how anxious you are. You are totally in control of the effort that you put in every day. And the other thing that you're totally in control of is your, ready, attitude. That's why the military makes their new folks make their bed in the morning. Because it's, a, it's an act of accomplishment. You know, all the people I counsel... That's one of my rules with them. Number one, they got to read scriptures. They got to read the book of Psalms. They got to read Proverbs. Hello, vertical relationship, horizontal relationship. They got to make their bed in the morning. I don't know. I don't want to hear it. Go to McDonald's. I don't want to hear it. Make your bed in the morning. That's one thing. Okay? Now, the other thing we got to get better at is retaining information. If you and I just, I'll show you the data. If you and I just hear something, at best, Pastor Craig smiling, right? You could, he's an academic like me. If you just hear something, your ability to retain it at best is 10%. Man, there's no good bet on this world, 10%, right? If you're ready for this, if you hear it and you see it, it's about 36.5%. Getting a little better. How do I really get it better? Okay, you got to do three things. Ready? There's no magic here. You got to hear something. You got to see it. Ready? And you have to explain it to someone. I remember my dad telling me that at an early age. Smart guy. Spoke four languages. He said, Tommy, if you can't explain how it works, you don't understand how it works. Okay, so the minute you hear something, you see it, and you explain it to someone else, you know what your retention level jumps up to? 94%. The best course I ever took from Syracuse University was memorization. You know what our final was? We had to memorize 25 Russian sailors' names for the final. Yeah, that's what I said. Well, I passed. So so some of the... Some of the tools for that is that you explain the names or you go through the list. The other thing, too, in regard, I just wrote an article in this. The other thing, too, about enhancing your memorization skills from the center part of your brain is that anything that you know during the day that is going to be important that you need to recall later on in the day or a month later, you really need to roll up your sleeves and really pay close attention to all the details. And then all of a sudden... When it's time to spit that out, you got it, okay? The other thing that is key is repetition, right? You know, I I used to teach cabinet making, and I I was a certified therapist too, but I taught cabinet making for 30 years. I guess what? After 30 years, I knew all the rules of my sleep. Someone would say, Bashiani, uh, I got a a 49-inch rise. How many... Treads and risers. Okay, you got 49 inches in rise. You got uh, seven risers and six treads, and you got a tread width of 11 inches with a 10 inch hangover. And they go, whoa. Not because I'm terribly intelligent, okay? It's because repetition is key. So the more you do something, what? The better you get. Okay? Don't you think? Okay. I thought it'd be really cool. We're doing good on time. I want to I want to take a very quick visit. You know, we looked at Genesis, what the earth was like back then. I'm going to take you what the earth looks like right now. Ready for this? Roll up your sleeves. It's going to be a roller coaster. How many people do you think are living right now on, on planet earth? Just take a guess. I cheated because I looked it up three years ago. You've been in my class before? <laughs> That's correct. Almost 8 billion people. That's a lot, right? Actually, it's 7.899999. Okay. So of the earth now as compared to when God created the earth, you know, we've had, <laughs> I chuckle, we've had some major changes on the earth, right? Okay, let me give you some data. 
most of it I have memorized, but okay. So if you look at the, the, the weight of earth, 90, 96% of the earth's weight comes from trees, plants, bacteria, and fungus. Oh, it gets better. Okay. <laughs> 0.36% of the weight of the earth comes from animals and fish population. Okay. How about people? How many pounds does the earth weigh because of people? 3.7% of the earth's mass is population. Okay, Bashani, if there's, uh, I get it. If I do my math quick and let's say we'll round it off, let's say there's 8 billion people. There's, on the average, for your notes, there's uh, 200,000 deaths a day in the world. So I said, okay, so how many births? So there's, pretty close, there's 150,000 births a day. So there's a difference of about, excuse me, 50,000 people, right? Now, the truth be known, uh, the population of the earth is, is increasing in leaps and bounds. Right? So we're going to have more and more people to uh, roll up our sleeves and have relations with. So, so I, I, I went around a barn on that one because, okay, so there's, okay, Bashiani, I got it. There's like 8 billion people. How, here's, a, here's a real important one. How many people do you rub shoulders with in a lifetime? I know. How do I think of this stuff? I wake up in the middle of the night thinking, man, I, so I run over to the library, my wife's going, True, true. Okay, so how many people do you rub shoulders with? You ready? Okay. This is pretty cool. So if the average life, ex this here, let me move this. Okay, here we go. That's you. Now, I know you're better looking than that, but that's, hi, Celia. <laughs> that's you. Now, the average life expectancy right now, ready for this, is 74 to 86 years. Now, most couples make babies around the age of 25 years old. And the average family has two kiddos. And each kiddo has two kiddos. So it goes on and on and on. So as if our life expect, I did the math, if our life expectancy is that, and we start making babies at about 25 years old, most grandparents, ready for this, you put it in your notes, most grandparents will see three generations of kiddos. And sometimes that's cut short, as we know, right? So as a family member, that's, those are real important relational pieces that you go through, right? Thank God for that. I know sometimes we get tired of picking up kids at basketball games, right? <laughs> Running here and there. But so, so in regard to family, if God continues to bless us, we'll see three generations. Okay, how about friends? How many friends do you have in a lifetime? Now, how would you define, what's the difference? Here's a word, right? I know I'm being academic again. but So what's the difference between a, uh, a true friend and, let's say, an acquaintance? What do you think? Like if I went to, I'll let you off the hook. If I went to Tops and my wife sent me there for, eggs and cream cheese and took me four hours to find it. But I did go, and <laughs> it's more truth than that than you know, right, Keith? And, and I saw some people that looked familiar to me, but I really didn't know the name. They weren't friends. They were, Friends. yeah, and even sometimes the word acquaintance is a stretch. But, you know, they smile back, so we'll call them acquaintances, all right? But people that we're used to listening to and feeling comfortable going over there for dinner. We'll call them friends, right? You know how many people, close friends you have usually in a lifetime? 150. Now, 
I'd be a liar to tell you that geographics doesn't count. Like if you, I'm from the South Bronx originally. There's no more crime in the South Bronx. You know why? There's nothing more to steal. <laughs> yeah. Sadly. But if you, <laughs> I could laugh. I was there. Okay, so if, <laughs> if you live in a city, all right, you can expect to see three new faces a day. Well, how about country people like you and I? I live on a farm now, right? What, how many people do we see? Okay, on the average in your lifetime, ready? You're going to see 80,000 people in a lifetime. So, okay, so uh, if you look at the scriptures, uh, we're told that uh, the harvest is plentiful, right? I mean, there's a lot of folks out there. And like I said a few minutes ago, everyone's got a story to tell. And what did I say uh, minutes ago? I said one of the most important things you can do is be around people. That's the best pill you can take, all right? And people, when people get unhooked, uh, that's when they go see clinical psychiatrists or therapists. Or, and those folks, God bless them, are in the business of giving them tools to, to get back to mind, body, and soul. There's that holistic approach again, right? Okay. We're doing great on time. Okay, I, I would be remiss if I didn't give you some tools for your toolbox. So I want to give you some tools tonight. You ready? And I promise I won't burn up your pens. At least I, it won't be intentional. Now, I'm going to give you some terrible statistics. I wish it'd be, I could give you better, but it's, it's the truth. Ready? And I'll give you some explanation in a minute, all right? 50, in 2023, and I, fo I follow it weekly, in 2023, 50% of marriages end in divorce. First marriages. And we all got it in our families, right? For second and third marriages, it jumps up to almost, it's 64 point like 9%. Almost 65% of marriages end in divorce. And why is that? Because there's money problems? Thinking. That's what we got to get straightened out, right? You know, when's it, when's it time to go see a therapist or your pastor or a clinical psychologist or psychiatrist? You know, when's the time for that? If you, if you know someone that's just really struggling with... And, I can answer questions about anxiety or depression, but let's say they're struggling with that. If it's get, here's the, here's the tipping point. If it's getting in the way of their doing life every day, then they need to see someone that's got a shingle out front, okay? Because they'll help them, you know, kind of sort some of that stuff out. And the good news is that we got, we got the scriptures, right? We got God's word that if we stay close to it, then a lot of those horizontal relationships are going to be rectified. Okay, I'm going to give you 10 reasons why in 2022, 50% of marriages broke up. Differences in money. Actually, a lot of people think it's poor communication, but poor communication is like seventh on the list. Money's a tough one, you know. Money is like, you know, you don't want to give up the keys to the kingdom. I get it. I understand. You know, I'm a businessman. I get it, right? Our goal in our marital relationships or even at work is ready for the, I know it seems terribly simplistic, but I believe this right to the core of my heart. But our goal is, bless you, our goal is to, roll up our sleeves, and get to the center of the road. 
That means giving up some stuff and, and embracing something else. Here's the famous quote. Your, I'm going to make sure I don't misquote it. Your opinion is only as valuable as your relationship. They both should have equal, actually, your relationship should have more weight than your opinion. You know, successful marriages ready for this? They have learned, I'll say this slow, successful marriages have learned that it's not more important to be right it's better it's more important to understand the other person that's one of the questions i give couples all the time okay okay roll up your sleeves here's a question for both of you right if you had an argument with your wife or your husband and 3 days later you find out that you were right what do you do how do you handle it what do you say <laughs> wrong answer yeah, <laughs> wrong answer, right? Because you could be in that same situation a week later, right? So it's not about being right. It's about understanding the person. Now, guys don't get, Jason, ready for this? Because I'm speaking to myself too. All you guys, you listening? Okay. We, <laughs> we don't do well at that, okay? Guys are really good at making statements. Follow me around in a day. Uh, it, it's opinion, right? So we make all these statements. And sadly, we very seldom use questions. Let me tell you the power. Of, there's some tremendous books on questions that you could read are just really telling. But when you use a question with a loved one, it sends, what do you think the message is to the loved one? That you're prying, trying to find stuff out? Or a, let's say a real positive, good intentional question. What kind of message do you think that sends? You'd be the counselors tonight. What do you think that sends? Pardon? Value their opinion. Okay? So, gentlemen, we need to get in the business of being question directed. Okay? <laughs> I think they compare notes every day, right? <laughs> Yeah, because every time you ask a question, it sends a message. I Listen, I care about what you say. And it's so much more than, than feeling like you got to be right all the time. So once again, your opinion is probably less value of, than your relationship should be, right? So, so if you got, remember that scales for good old New York State? You know, when you get in the mail, you get a ticket, and you see that scale on there? Well, <laughs> One side, one side is your opinion, and the other side is your relationship, right? And if anything, you, you know, you, you should have more weight on the relationship, the, va the value of the relationship. Make sense? Okay. And, and people who had marital issues didn't do real well at that. Here's another, another fly in the ointment or be under the saddle, okay? A lot of times in relationships, they get fractured because expectations were never voiced or shared. Or they were shared and they were broken. But many times they were never shared. Now, how do you know what your expectations of your loved one is? Excuse me. Should we ask? Good idea. It's better than making a statement, right? Now, you know, the words we use are very important, too. Here, this should go in your notes, too. Anytime you're having a discussion with someone at work or a marital discussion or your past or anyone, you really want to weigh the words that you use, okay? A really strong, positive word is the word we. You know, what? so let's say we're at work. Let's say we work together, right? And a machine went down, so our boss is going to rip us one here in a minute. So we look at each other and we say, you know, what, here's, here's the question. What can we do to help fix it, right? So in other words, it's a, it's a team effort. You know, the marriages that are really strong that I've looked at over the years, they're, they're, it's a team effort. They each got their back. I don't care if they get a million dollars, they hit the lotto or 
They're just, their chins are dragging on the floor. It's a team effort. They're together, right? Anytime you use the word you, what happens? The big wall goes up. I never forget, my father had a factory in New York City. He made shampoo for like places like Holiday Inn. And he'd put their name up. You know when you go to a hotel and you get shampoo in the shower, right? They last me about a half a shower. You know those little bottles? Oh, it was my father. So my father would take me there on Saturdays. I was little. So we go on this elevator and I go up to the fifth floor in the Bronx. I was on uh, 151st Street. And we get off the elevator and there's a rat in there the size of King Kong. I never forget. So my father says, get back, Tommy, get back. So he, he gets a broom, and, he, and the rat's in the corner, like, woo, dancing, right? So my father gets a broom. He's going to hit him in the head. We'll guess that it didn't work. I watched him. He gets to the corner. He starts lunging for the rat with the broom. The rat runs up the broom around his neck and jumps off. Oh! <laughs> that was 65 years ago, and I still remember that. But the point I want to make is anytime you use the word you, you put a rat in the, not a rat, you put the person in, shame on me, right? You put the person in the corner, right? Okay. So we shouldn't do that. So, so weigh your words. Words can be what? Tremendous building blocks or they can be what? Terribly detrimental. Okay, Bashani, explain that. I'm glad you asked that. Okay, so for a lot of communication, it's not so much the words you use, it's the Body language. Ready for this? Put this in your notes. 70% of your communication is body language. One winter, I studied all the methods the FBI uses to profile people. Big mistake. So I go to the airport with my wife, and she'd be sitting next to me. I said, see that guy? <laughs> she said, she'd shake her head. She said, no, no, don't say that. See that guy? She go, no, 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 no. See how he's walking? <laughs> I'm exaggerating. But, you know, there's, some, <laughs> you know, body language is that's so important, you know. When I taught kiddos, uh, you know, kids sometimes will throw up this tremendous fence or wall because they're afraid or they've, they've been abused or they've been through hell and back and they got some trauma going on. Psychology, we say all the time, trauma is stored in the body, right? So that stuff happens uh, in life. It gets stored in your body, and it's, it's, it's doable to fix, but it takes, it takes some time to do it. So anyway, when you walk up to someone and your antennas come up because you're a believer and God gives you opportunity to speak into someone's life, how do you start the conversation? I mean, what do you say, right? Unless you're terribly good-looking. You know, they'll smile and say, what do you got to say? But that's, in my case, it's not going to happen. So what do you say? Okay, here's my, here's my line I used for 35 years when I was teaching. I'd say, come on, let's get something to eat. A lot of good things have been happening from sharing a little food, right? You can tell me I haven't missed many snacks. <laughs> so I belly up to these boys. I had 34, most, back then they were called, mostly disturbed 18-year-olds, right? We'll talk about a horse and pony show. My boss would just shake his head when he went by my room. But it worked. It worked. So I walk up to him, you know, and I could tell when they were having a bad day. So I get him on the side. I buy him something to eat in the machine. Back then, you could really buy a Coke in a machine. You don't get fruit juice. You're like, oh, my God. So, and then I'd say, ready? I'd say, can I have permission to speak into your life? And he'd look at me like, Okay. And we talk. I had a student one time in his, uh, <laughs> funny story, his parents were going through divorce, you know, and there's, that's one of those stories, like God said, give him a Bible, and I said, I ain't doing that, I'll get fired, you know. So I talked to, the, I, I said, can I have permission to speak in your life? He's just having a really hard time. So he said, sure. So I get done talking, I give, I give him this Bible, Kid graduates, do a little better. Next semester, next year, the superintendent calls me on the intercom in my shop. They only call you that if the building's on fire or something's really wrong. So he said, uh, the 
his secretary said, Mr. Bashiani? I said, yes. Uh, the superintendent would like to see you after school. I said, okay. So like all day, I'm like, so I go in the office, big man. I go in the office. He said, Tom, have a seat. I said, here we go. And he said, uh, <clears throat> question. I said, sure. He said, you give a kid a Bible? I said, when? He started to chuckle. He said, you know what I mean. When did you give your kid a Bible? You mean the last time? He said, yeah, when? I said, last year. He said, you know who that kid was? I said, no. He said, that's my new son-in-law. And I want to thank you for doing that. <laughs> How cool is that? So everyone's got a story to tell, right? Okay. Am I boring you? You doing okay? Okay, some of the couples that their relationship was sound because one of them was narcissistic. Boy, that's a, everyone's using that word these days. What does that mean? Self-indulgent. I come first. They only know one song. Me, 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 me. And the other three are relational abuse. Oh, this is a tough one. Secret life habits. You find out your mate's got a gambling addiction and they... He or she just cleaned out your checking account. Oh, here's the tough one, too. Take a deep breath. A lot of uh, couples that broke up was because of emotional unresponsiveness. Boy, that's a key word. What does that mean? That's a mouthful in psychology. What do you think that means? means you're 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 you turn your back on your wife or husband's tough times that they're going through. You know, you hear them but you really don't hear them, right? You're like numb to it. And that's not the place to be. Okay, now I got to give you some good news cuz I don't want you leaving here depressed. Okay, how many close friends do you run? I'm going to be Mr. Teacher. Ready? Here we go. Fail the test. You're in trouble. Got to stay after school. Celia? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> how many people would you expect as friends you would rub shoulder with, shoulders with in a year? No. <laughs> 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 Correct. Is she correct? Yes. Okay. Very good. <laughs> Who's next? Okay. Let's take a look at this list here, and we'll close. And then I'll entertain some questions if you have them. Okay, so if God is our prominent relationship, and we've looked at the scriptures, and we know that to be true, that vertical relationship like we talked about should affect all these different relationships, okay? Now, the only, only, only other one that I really didn't spend a lot of time with is that you also and I also have a relationship, ready, with ourselves. Pretty important stuff. Three years ago, I invited one of the psychologists from the, this is not on Facebook, I'm okay, from uh, Boston Red Sox. He came and he spent three days. Brother, son, he went fishing. But I had a different reason why I invited him, because I, we could talk shop. <laughs> really interesting stuff. And... And I knew his father, you know. So he came and we talked. And I said, tell me a little about your job because it's very fascinating. He said, you know, Bashiani, th this is really cool. He said, you know, all the athletes that make the Boston Red Sox, as you would expect, they're, they're extremely physically talented. But he said, the ones that you can count on one hand, uh, 
that just excel. They practice, ready for this? The message for all of us. They practice positive self-talk. I, I push that big time. You know, for years you hear, well, is it, is it you're crazy because you talk to yourself? No, it's not. Actually, it's very therapeutic. Okay? And it's very encouraging to do that. Psalm 119, my lips are getting tired. Psalm 119, verse 59 says, David, he says, ready for this? I thought about my ways and I turned my feet. So David picks up the scriptures, just like Mike Tyson, and he looks at those scriptures and he says, that's not me. So what does David say? Does he throw the Bible out and say, I give up? I thought about my ways and I what? Turn my feet. So the expectation, ready? I'm looking at all of you. The expectation from God is, is that we should stop and think. We don't do that anymore. We're so busy going to and fro, right? God fully expects us to think. Now, if you're like me, Nighttime is not a good time for me. Eight o'clock, I'm like one of those little dolls my sister had. You, you take that little doll and just turn her and the eyeballs just shut. That's me at eight o'clock. That ain't going to work. So I got to do my thinking, good thinking in the morning, right? So pick a time that works for you. Okay, we're doing great on time. You got any questions for the old man? Glad to anything. Psychology, relational. When are we going home? We doing good? How do you think these work relationships are different than, say, family relationships? I mean, there's some definitely some differences there, do you think? Most of you work. All of you work. What do you think? What were some of the challenges back then? Yeah, that's a big one, right? Personality traits. You know, a few minutes ago I mentioned family chemistry. That's a big thing. You know, people have open wounds that never, for a lot of different reasons, never got addressed, you know. And the biggest lie ever told to mankind is is that time heals all things. That's not true. Thank you. Did you hear that? God heals all things. Yes. Lance, that's right on spot, man. A couple of years ago, I wrote an article called The Bloodhounds of Mankind. They're, I mean, they're right there. That's quite a title, right? I mean, they're watching us, right? So you know what the three most powerful words that you can say sometimes in relationships? Ready? My wife will tell you I'm getting better at this. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm getting better. Ready? I am sorry. That moves mountains. Don't you think? I messed up. Now, when does I am, wrote an article in this too, when does I am sorry get old and people don't start, don't listen to it anymore? You know when that happens? (laughs) They don't see any improvement. (laughs) Right? So anytime you say I'm sorry, and I've tried to do this, anytime you say I'm sorry to someone, you ought to come up with some constructive uh, pathways that you're going to follow so you're going to try not, not that it couldn't, but try not so it doesn't happen again, right? Listen, I'm sorry I took your parking space. I didn't see your name on the sign reserve, but, but next time I'll park on the street so that doesn't happen. Well, there ought to be, <laughs> down the road, there ought to be some times where we could see improvement. Uh, some years ago, I, I did a seminar down south, and this uh, elderly couple, I'm 71, this elderly couple came up to me, and they said, Tom, can we ask you a question? And I said, sure. They said, you know, our grandson lives with us. Uh, his parents, my son, kicked him out of the house. Uh, we bought him a car. Uh, we sent him to community college. 
And the father said, you know where I'm going with this story? He uh, took the car and crashed it, flunked out of college. And their question to me is, you know, one's, one's enough is enough. What would your response be to that, do you think, or should be as a Christian person? What could you say? Do you, ter- do you say, there co- there, I'll let you off the hook. There comes a time where we reach out and help people, but there needs to be some uh, observable wake of that person going in the right direction, all right? Because what happens is, we're not doing them any favors, right, by continuing to, you know, give them money or set them up or whatever, right? That's a tough sell, but that's, you know, that's an important thing. Yeah, tough love. Yeah. And, you know, I can tell you, uh, back in the 70s, I worked with uh, Vets coming back that were addicted to heroin, and uh, they were administering uh, methadone in New York City. And uh, a lot of those poor folks, a lot of them never got better until they really hit the bottom, you know, when they, this little voice said, enough is enough, you know. But that, listen, that's where you guys come in, right? You're the light. We, you were made in Christ's image. Roll up your sleeves. You got power, man. Speak into someone's life. Give them some encouragement. Be a good listener. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Really good point, Celia. And you know, Celia, I think you would agree with this. Very often we end up sharing some very intimate things that we don't share with family members sometimes, with people that we work with. I mean, you look at all the time you spend at work, right? Hours. Yeah. Yes. There's an old saying, you learn more from a stranger in 20 minutes than someone you know for 20 years, you know. You know, when you, you guys fly in airplanes too, you get on an airplane, you sit next to someone, man, you know, 20 minutes, you know their whole life story. You know how many kids, right? <laughs> Rodney's laughing. Isn't that true? It's true. <laughs> so here's your challenge, all right? God's got all these divine appointments for you guys. It's not enough just to read the scriptures, right? It's to put the scriptures into action, right? And shame on us if we don't. Let me pray for you guys. Lord, thank you for this evening, and I thank for all these folks taking time. They, they uh, voted with their feet tonight to get some things that <clears throat> so they can get closer to you, Lord. So, Lord, I, I covet your, uh, your grace, and I covered your strength and wisdom as we go from here, Lord, and, and I pray specifically for divine appointments, Lord. Help us to be uh, a life changer. Help us to grab someone by the hand and help them get to a place where they need to be. As we go from here now, keep some of those 12-foot angels around us. Keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, guys.